Hello and welcome back. I decided to start a series about operational amplifiers to explore their benefits but also their real life limitations. Taking a look at what you should pay attention to when choosing one over the other. But before all that, it's important to understand how the op amp works, what's inside of one, and what are the main characteristics of an ideal op amp, since those are the things that you will never actually get from the real component. So if you're curious about that and many other things, then keep watching. Now, before going into any details, why would you even bother using an operational amplifier? I mean, you can build a very nice amplifier from discrete components, like we have in the schematic. This will work really well, and if you actually build it, it's going to look something like this. So what I got here is a board from an old Russian radio, from the early 70s. And the schematic is roughly the one you can see. Now, the first thing you will notice is the sheer size of the thing. I mean, sure, you can build it smaller if you want to, but basically that's just the fun of building circuits from discrete components. They're going to be big, you're going to see every single piece of it. An operational amplifier, an integrated operational amplifier on the other hand, is going to be much smaller. Like I've got this antique analog devices 118K. I mean it's huge, but it's smaller than the discrete version. And if we move further in time, op amps have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And right up to the modern day when we use surface mounted devices, which became even smaller, like this tiny little op amp. And of course you can get them even smaller than this. So the first advantage of an integrated operational amplifier over a discrete amplifier is the size. The integrated solution will always be smaller than the discrete solution. But that does not mean that an op amp can be made from discrete components. The very first commercial op amp was actually made with vacuum tubes. And then the first solid state ones appeared, made from components. And only later did the first integrated versions appear. So the question remains, what makes the op-amp so special? What makes it different from a classical amplifier? Well this can be understood by looking at its earliest usage. The op-amps were used for electronic calculations. The name operational comes from performing operations, mathematical operations. The first op-amps were used in analog computers. Now how could you possibly do something like this? Well, the op amps have some very interesting properties. You can set very precisely the gain of your circuit. Therefore, you can build quite easily circuits that can calculate the difference between two voltages, circuits that can calculate sums of various voltages. You can build differentiators, integrators, and by combining exponential and logarithm functions, you can build multiplication and divider circuits. So basically you can do any sort of mathematical operations with voltages. So you can perform operations with them, hence the name operational amplifier. Now to understand how the op amp works, we need to take a better look at it. So this is the sort of amplifier you used to have before operational amplifiers became widespread. In this amplifier, your gain, so the ratio by which your output signal is larger than your input signal, is set partially by your passive components, your resistors, but mostly by your amplifying element, in this case the transistor. Now there's a small problem with that. Transistor gain is highly unpredictable. Based on production lot, temperature and operating parameters, you can vary for the same transistor the gain by a very large amount. Even in the datasheet of a transistor, your gain will be expressed as an interval, starting from somewhere around 100 to 500, but this depends of course on the exact transistor you're using. It can be higher or lower. So, for this circuit in particular, the total gain is highly unpredictable. But that's okay, we can fix that. And you do this by applying negative feedback. Again, here we have an amplifier, three transistors in a row. The total gain of this transistor group is extremely high, so the gain of each transistor is multiplied with the gain of the previous transistor, giving us a total somewhere between 1000 and 100,000, depending on what transistor you've been using. So again, we still have the problem of unprecise gain. But this is the trick. You use negative feedback. Part of your output signal gets fed back into your input. And basically, the gain of this circuit will not be set by the transistors themselves, but by the ratio of the input resistance and the feedback resistance. Basically, this circuit works like an inverting op-amp circuit, where your gain can be set by only these two resistors. 
So is this an op amp? Well not really. We still have a bit of a problem with this circuit. The types of signals this can work with are AC signals, alternating signals. This will not work with DC signals. We can see that we have a DC blocking capacitor on the input and a DC blocking capacitor on the output. The same was with our previous schematic and the schematic we looked at at the beginning of this video. Now why is that? Why can't we amplify DC signals with this thing? Let's look a bit at our first transistor. You've got a pull-up resistor on the base and then your emitter is pulled directly to ground. Now if we consider this point our input and this our input signal, then the output voltage of the amplifier, so the first transistor plus everything that's afterwards, will be the total gain of the circuit. So if we don't take into account any feedback resistors or anything, it's the open loop gain times our input voltage minus a threshold voltage. What threshold? Well in this case the threshold needed to drive the bipolar transistor, around 0.7 volts. Now the input voltage can have only a very slight variation around this operating point. If you go above 0.8 you will destroy the transistor, if you go below 0.6 nothing will happen since you will be too far below your threshold voltage to actually drive the transistor. Now of course this can be fixed by adding certain resistors and establishing a different operating point but your input voltage range will always be very small. You cannot have a very wide DC input voltage range. And that is why this sort of amplifier is built as an AC amplifier, not as a DC amplifier. And this is where the op amp is different. The input stage of the op amp looks a bit different than this. And this is what your basic op amp input stage looks like. It's a comparator. And what's special about this is that you're no longer comparing an input voltage to a threshold voltage set by your circuit parameters, so base emitter voltage or whatever resistors you've used, you're actually comparing one input voltage to another input voltage. And your output voltage is the difference of these two times a certain gain. So this time with the exact same circuit you can have any sort of threshold voltage. It's no longer set by the circuit itself. Now this sort of amplifier has also a different name. This can be called a DC amplifier, whereas the amplifier we looked at previously is an AC amplifier. And basically your operational amplifier is built with this sort of comparator input stage and then some sort of amplifier and output stage afterwards. And basically that's it. That's what an op amp is. In its most simple form it's a five terminal component with a symbol similar to a triangle. It has two supply pins, positive and a negative input voltage, two input pins, a non-inverting and an inverting input and a single output. And there is the relationship between these signals. First of all, the component is a voltage amplifier, meaning it will take the voltage values of the inputs, compare them with the comparator which we just talked about, and create a voltage on the output based on these input signals. So the voltage on the output is related to the difference between the voltages on the inputs. The link between these two terms is finished by adding the amplifier's gain which for the ideal op amp is infinite. So how does this work? I mean, if the voltage on your positive input is one volt and the voltage on your negative input is zero volts, then how much is your output voltage? Based on this formula with the gain of infinity, this output should be infinite. So is it like that? Well, not really. Even for the ideal op amp, the output value must be somewhere in between the positive and negative supply voltages. So in the case of this example, our output voltage will be our positive supply voltage. Now if we switch the two inputs, then our output voltage will be the value of our lower supply pin, so V minus. This isn't very helpful. We get one extreme or the other, but we can't really get a value in between. Or can we? Well, of course we can. And this is achieved by using negative feedback, by taking part of the output, feeding it to our inverting input, either directly or through a resistor divider. Let's look at a couple examples. Here we got an amplifier with direct negative feedback and an amplifier with feedback through a resistor divider. Now the same gain formula is valid, but only on the amplifier level. So how can we solve it? How can we determine the output voltage? Well, since the gain is large, any difference between the input voltages will cause the output to go to either extreme. But since our output is connected to our inverting input, going to either extreme will cause our circuit to oscillate 
to go between the positive and the negative input voltage extremes. But in reality, the circuit will not oscillate, at least not the ideal one. Instead, it will find a stable position in between these two extremes. And this is achieved only under one condition, and that being that the two input voltages have roughly the same value. In this case, the output voltage can have a stable value in between the two extremes. And by this logic, we can work out what the outputs of these two circuits will be. So in the case of our first output, the only way to get the same voltage on both the non-inverting and inverting inputs of the op-amp is if the output has exactly the same voltage as the input. This circuit is also called the voltage follower, since the output follows the input voltage. In the case of our second circuit, the voltage on our inverting input pin will be the output voltage divided by whatever values we've used for our resistor divider. If the two resistors have the same value, then our inverting input voltage will be half that of the output voltage, meaning that this circuit will amplify the input voltage by two, if the two resistors are the same, or by a different ratio by using other resistors. And this is also called the non-inverting amplifier, since the input and output voltage will have the same polarity. And by this logic we can work out what the output voltage will be on all the classical op-amp configurations. Now, talking about this output voltage, an ideal op-amp will reach this stable point instantly, and will be able to work with input signals of any frequency. Now, the practical amplifier is not as straightforward as this. It has various constructive limitations, both from the input and the output stage. But that is a topic for another time. I will start to go into these details next time. For now, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, please subscribe to be up to date with my latest videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.